Icebergs are magnificent objects. We've all, at some point, been told that the majority of their volume remains unseen, looming beneath the surface of the water. It is so commonly known, in fact, that it's been incorporated in common language by referring to the tip of the iceberg to indicate that what is apparent does not always represent the entire thing. As such, we've all seen these daunting looking pictures of icebergs extending their massive volume underwater. But are these representations realistic, or are they exaggerated? That's what we'll find out in this video, where we will calculate exactly how much of the iceberg remains underwater and why it has this behavior in the first place. It will serve as a perfect application to learn about the buoyancy force, which determines whether an object floats or sinks. We will build on basic observations and ultimately arrive at the formula that captures our intuition about this subject. This is the perfect way of doing physics which makes it much easier to commit these concepts to memory. As always, if you have any questions or remarks, leave them in the comments down below and I will respond. We start with the buoyancy force. Consider a container filled with a fluid. You can take water, but it can be any other fluid you like. In it, we insert an object of arbitrary form, and for now, the material, and thus its density, is still unknown. So intuitively, we don't know whether it will go to the surface and float, or sink to the bottom. What we do know, however, is that there are two forces acting on this object. There is of course the force of gravity pointing downwards, pulling the object towards the bottom. We know, on the other hand, that some objects actually float, and thereby counteracting this force of gravity. Therefore, there must be a force pointing upward, and it is exerted on the object by the surrounding fluid. This is what we call the buoyancy force. We now see that it is the relative magnitude of these two forces that determines whether the object floats or sinks. It is a battle between gravity wanting to sink the object and buoyancy wanting to make it float. All we need to do now is to rewrite these forces in terms of properties of the system itself. For gravity, this is straightforward and we know this. Fg is simply equal to the mass of the object times the gravitational constant. And then the mass of the object can be written as its volume multiplied by its density. So one of the two we have down. But what about buoyancy? Well, let's find that out right now. First, what exactly is buoyancy? What is the origin of this force pushing the object upwards? To understand this, we need to consider the pressure inside the fluid and its key properties. We know that pressure acts in any direction and that its magnitude increases with the depth beneath the surface. This is captured in the formula that P, the pressure, is equal to rho times H times G. And it is this H that indicates the depth beneath the surface. Knowing this, we can imagine the pressure force exerted on the bottom of the object pushing upwards will be larger than the pressure force pushing downwards on the top of the object. And due to this difference, there will be a net force pointing upwards, and this force is called the buoyancy. How can we now get from this intuitive picture to a formula we can use to compare with the force of gravity? The key step here is to consider the question for which object do we know that both forces cancel each other out perfectly, meaning that the object neither floats nor sinks, but just remains stationary. After some thinking, we intuitively realize that this will occur only if the object has the same density as the surrounding fluid. Therefore, if we only keep the contours of our object, but replace the material with the surrounding fluid, the force of gravity and buoyancy will be equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. Note that I subscript these specific forces with a small f, just to denote that we are considering the fluid object at this point, which is the object with the same contours or volume as the previous object, but now made up of the surrounding fluid. We can rewrite the force of gravity as being the mass of the object multiplied by the gravitational constant. And then the mass of the object in turn can be rewritten as the volume of the object multiplied with its density. 
where Vf is the volume of the object that is submerged in the fluid, and in this case, it's the entire object itself. Now, to generalize this formula for any object, not just this fluid object, we remind ourselves that the origin of this buoyancy force is the net pressure force acting on the surface of the object by the surrounding fluid. Thus, this force does not depend on the material of the object, and therefore, we can drop this subscript F on the buoyancy force. This leads to the general formula that the buoyancy force is equal to the volume submerged in the fluid times the fluid's density multiplied with the gravitational constant. And at this point, we are done. We have found what we wanted a clear formula based on the system properties for the buoyancy force. At this point, we can return to the original situation with an object of unknown density. We found that an object floats when the buoyancy force is larger than the force of gravity. Now we can rewrite these forces with what we have found. The buoyancy force is the submerged volume multiplied by the density of the fluid multiplied by g and gravity is simply the mass of the object multiplied also with g. And again, the mass of the object can be written as the volume of the object multiplied with the density of this object. And here we need to make the important distinction between Vf, the volume submerged in the fluid, and Vo, the total volume of the object. This will be very important once we start looking at the icebergs. And at this point, we can of course cancel out G. And if the object is fully submerged in the fluid, as is the case on the sketch, then Vf is equal to Vo, and therefore they can be cancelled out as well. Then we are only left with the following intuitive explanation. The object floats if its density is lower than the density of the fluid. And for sinking objects, you can make the exact same reasoning but just the other way around. And it is in this way that we arrive to the intuitive understanding that objects float or sink only based on the density of both the fluid and the object. At this point, we have all of the tools necessary to answer our original question about the iceberg. The massive volume of ice floats at the surface of the water. And since it does not move either way, it is in equilibrium, and therefore both forces balance each other out. So Fb, the buoyancy force, is equal to Fg, the force of gravity. Filling in both of these forces with what we have found, we get that the volume of the iceberg that is submerged in the water, Vf, multiplied by the density of the water, rho f, multiplied by the gravitational constant, is equal to the total volume of the iceberg multiplied by its density multiplied by the gravitational constant. And again here, we can cancel out g. Now in contrast with the previous case, the object here is not completely submerged in water, and therefore Vf is not equal to Vo. And this does not surprise us, because the ratio of these two volumes is exactly what we are looking for. Rearranging this equation, we find that Vf is equal to the volume of the object multiplied by the ratio of the density of the object divided by the density of the fluid. And then we look up the specific values. We know that the density of ice, so rho O, is equal to 917 kilograms per cubic meter, and the density of seawater is equal to 1030 kilograms per cubic meter. If we now fill in these values in our equation, we find that Vf, so the volume that is submerged by the water, is equal to the total volume multiplied by 0 0.89. And this is the final answer to the question that we were looking for. 89% of the total volume of the iceberg is submerged in the water, and thus remains unseen to those on its surface. And this brings us to the end of this video, and I hope that you enjoyed it and learned something along the way. And if you did so, consider giving this video a thumbs up, which helps getting it in front of more people. And if you really liked it and you want to see more in the future, you can of course always subscribe. And with that, I thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.